invitarlos a que si no lo han hecho se suscriban a nuestro canal y por qué no darle like a esta transmisión. También exhortarles que durante todo el día usted puede hacer las preguntas y tanto Odalis, Joana y Joel estarán escribiéndola, pues le vamos a hacer llegar esas preguntas a los charlistas y ellos le van a contestar a través de un correo electrónico. Así que durante la transmisión en vivo siéntanse en confianza de hacer las preguntas y nosotros le vamos a hacer llegar las respuestas. Así que atentos muchachos. Bueno, vamos a darle paso a nuestra próxima charla y la próxima intervención. Estoy seguro que como developer han escuchado hablar de Cloud y Kubernetes Technology. Que dicho sea de paso, esta se ha convertido en una tendencia manejando virtualización de infraestructura. Pero, ¿saben ustedes qué es Kubernetes? ¿Por qué hay tanto alboroto? ¿Cómo esto funciona? Hoy en el Call Cam SDQ Live 2020, Man, Developer Advocate en IBM, nos enseñará todo lo que debemos de saber sobre Kubernetes para que así comencemos a descubrir las virtudes de esta tecnología. Hello, welcome. Thank you so much, CodeCamps SDQ, for this opportunity to talk to all of you about Kubernetes and developer introduction. My name is Mofi, and I will try to introduce all of you today uh, to Kubernetes. Uh, before we get started, what is the agenda? What are we talking about today? Who I am, what Kubernetes is, what Kubernetes does, how it is all working together, and then some concept of Kubernetes. So that is the agenda. We have a pretty short amount of time today, so I want to get into it as quick as possible. Before we get started, Let's talk about who I am real quick. My name is Mofi. I have been at this uh, CodeCamp SCU last year. It was a great experience for me. That's why I was very happy to come back this year as well. Uh, you can, if you need to reach out to me, talk to me about anything, have any questions after this uh, conference, please feel free to reach out any of the social media that is out there at Mofi Codes. Uh, so I am a developer advocate at IBM, mostly the container things, collect stickers. This year I can't, unfortunately, but also I write some Go code. Uh, when I get the chance. So what is Kubernetes? If you want to think about Kubernetes in the very shortest format, uh, the way to think about it, it is API to compute resources. So you write your application and you want to run it somewhere, uh, you need some compute resource to be able to run that workload somewhere. And Kubernetes gives you a very nice API to just, uh, get that computer resource to run your application. It is modeled after the Borg that was initially created at Google back in 2006. It's an open source project. Now it is probably the biggest open source project that the world has ever seen, only next to a Linux project. Okay, I'm seeing... Hmm. Is the audio level okay? I'm just making, trying to make sure. I think some, I'm seeing some comment on the chat uh, the, about the audio level. Okay, so I think, I think that's been taken care of in the background. So what does Kubernetes do? Kubernetes is the Linux kernel of distributed systems. What that does mean is that Linux kernel, when a user needs some workload to be run, the kernel takes care of that workload being scheduled, being uh, done, and then giving resources, giving resources to other things. Kubernetes try to do the same thing for distributed systems. Uh, your workload, uh, your workload then just distributed in multiple nodes. You can have nodes in the runtime. You can add more nodes as you're using it. We're gonna see all the how all that works in a second. So Kubernetes architecture, how does this all fit together? Uh, Kubernetes has a few basic parts. The first thing is masters. Uh, that is the brain behind Kubernetes. Right after that, you have, uh, so market masters are, act as the primary control plane. It is responsible for running the minimum API of Kubernetes. Uh, if, if you want to just run a master, it is possible to run Kubernetes just in a single node with a master, but that is the brain behind Kubernetes. Then you have nodes, that's your worker that is doing the actual workload. If you think in traditional term, that is your VMs that your workload runs in, 
that ma masters know and control. Um, so then if you want to look at a picture of Kubernetes from like a 40,000 feet view, this is what you're looking at. You have your Kubernetes master and master controls one to N nodes. And those nodes uh, are doing the work in various different formats. But the way we access the master to let Kubernetes know what work we want to run on it is done via an API. This is a REST server that Kubernetes master runs. And we as a user have access to it either via the UI from our browser or a CLI tool that we can use from our command line. We're gonna later in the presentation, hopefully we'll get to see some demo where I use the CLI to show you uh, how to uh, do some things in the Kubernetes cluster. So if I want to like zoom in a little bit and look at the master, what do the components master have? And uh, the first thing master has is an API server. That is the server we're communicating when you're making any commands, sending any commands to Kubernetes. Then we have a scheduler that is scheduling workload as they come, as we ask for a workload to be run, the scheduler figures out where it can place those work in the nodes that we have available. Uh, it has a controller. Controller is just like a for loop that is infinitely looping uh, and listening for any changes that happen in your workload. And if there is any change, it will execute those changes and make sure your cluster is always in a state up to date with the configuration. Uh, then you have the cloud controller, and this is a feature available only on if you're deploying Kubernetes on some sort of cloud provider. Uh, this is negotiating with the cloud how to deploy new resources if you want to. For example, uh, uh, let's say you are running it on IBM Cloud and you want more nodes to be added to your Kubernetes cluster. Your cluster then will talk to cloud controller that will go in the background and deploy that node and attach it back to your cluster. Uh, then you have a kube proxy. This is sending the request from a master and communicating with the node directly with the proxy. And finally, you have the etcd. The etcd is kind of like the memory of Kubernetes, which keeps track what should be the current state of this cluster. As new changes come in, you update the etcd database, and the controller then looks at the database and tries to make sure that your cluster is always in that stable state. Um, depending on how you're running your master, there is a, also a chance you can have a container runtime and kubelet running in your master. Um, the reason that is colored in yellow and dots is because if you are using some sort of managed Kubernetes ser service, most likely you wouldn't have this configuration. This is so that you could run some workload on master as well, which is usually not this, but if you're deploying your own Kubernetes or you just play it out, you can technically install kubelet also in the same node as the master and uh, do some work on the master itself. So let's now take a zoomed in look at the node. What does the node have? The very first thing the node have is a container runtime. A container runtime is anything that can run a container. And notice how I didn't mention here Docker runtime because Kubernetes doesn't 100% depend on Docker. Any container runtime that is um, that matches the container runtime initiative will do Kubernetes. You can run a workload on that kind of container runtime. Then you have the kubelet. So kubelet is the agent that Kubernetes runs on each node that then talks back to the master, letting it know what the current state of that node is, or how much resource it has available, how much uh, if it is reaching its limit, or it has nothing running. So kubelet and Kubernetes master negotiate between each other. And that's how scheduler knows exactly which node has space to run new workload. Then you have queue proxy, and you can notice the same queue proxy is also available in the master. That's how our Kubernetes and Kubernetes um, masters and nodes are talking to each other. Then you have n numbers of pods running within a single node. A pod, we're gonna see in a bit a second, but a pod is the smallest unit of deployment within Kubernetes. And then you also have image registry. So image registry is, again, your container images, downloaded locally on your node so that next time you have to run an application, you don't have to download that same image over again. Uh, and you can some, have some optional add-ons such as DNS, UI. Uh, UI is like a UI dashboard that you can go and see in Kubernetes. And DNS is available for you to be able to talk to other services that are running your cluster with their name instead of having to do it with their IP. So let's uh, dive a little bit deeper into master components, what is in there. Uh, so again, so we have this fixed as we have seen earlier. Um, so the API server, etcd, kube controller, cloud controller, and kube scheduler. 
Uh, API Server is a forward-facing REST interface. So again, from a user's point of view, we're talking to Kubernetes via the UI or the CLI tool. We are uh, making REST calls uh, to this and sending information, changes, updates, deletes, all that to the Kubernetes cluster. And that is taking action based on that. HCD is the memory, as we talked earlier. It just keeps track of what should be the current state of the cluster. Kube Controller Manager is an infinite loop that's keep on running uh, forever. And any changes that happen to any of the resources, it can then take action to make sure it matches the HCD state that you have saved. Our Cloud Controller Manager negotiates with our cloud. Then Scheduler just uh, tries to schedule our workload into a machine. So the Scheduler is a super fascinating uh, piece of software that we like Kubernetes has. It is it can uh, reconcile your schedule even, it, it, let's say a node that has a lot of workload being done on it, all of a sudden gets disconnected or dies, scheduler then can reconcile that and make sure that all the workload that was running in that node gets safely removed and added to somewhere else. That is a big part why Kubernetes is getting more and more famous because as a developer or as a user, you can now uh, have the guarantee that your workload, no matter what happens, will be running as long as you have the resource available, of course. And those late night calls that are like, oh, all of a sudden service is down are hopefully at some point going to be a thing of the past. So let's talk about the node components. Uh, first of all, we have the kubelet, which is the agent uh, for Kubernetes master to be able to talk to, um, to, to, be able to talk to this uh, particular node. It has information about file path, HTTP endpoint, and it's also doing some HCD watch. Uh, so if it's making any change, HCD Watch is letting the other HCD know, and that changes are taken care of. You have the proxy, so it has it proxies the network rules, right? You have the, it, it, that's how Kubernetes nodes talk to each other. Uh, then you have the container runtime. Again, I meant as I mentioned, Docker is not the only container runtime I can use here. We can make use of things like Container D, Cryo, RKT, Kata, Bartlett. Uh, again, as they, for, from a user's point of view, most of this is hidden away underneath. We don't have to know exactly which container runtime we're using unless we're doing something very specific that requires some uh, knowledge of the underlying runtime. Most cases, because they're all following the CRI, container runtime interface, we are uh, okay with using or switching or swapping them at runtime. We're going to get the same result. Some additional uh, services, so you have the kube DNS, any service running on Kubernetes, we can then talk to it directly with the service name, even if the pod that is that service running as dies and comes back alive. We have hipster that is collecting logs from all running pods. If you want to have a kube dashboard or kube metrics dashboard, uh, you need to have some sort of metric collector that lets you know that you are using X amount of resources. Uh, then you have the kube dashboard, it's an optional deployment you can make that allows you to have a dashboard that you can go see uh, your running Kubernetes cluster. For networking, uh, we're not gonna go too much in depth because again, uh, I want to be able to show you some live demo as well in the end, but uh, Kubernetes has a network layer that is running on top. Uh, and so you have this bunch of this uh, resource on Kubernetes, all of them can talk to each other because you have this network overlay that makes it, um, even if you have more than one node, you have hundreds of nodes, the network interface stays pretty much consistent. So as you are increasing number of nodes, adding more nodes, your network layer, you don't have to go manually change any network interface. Everything just like works. Um, so you have the, the reason networking in Kubernetes is, is, is such a like a big topic is that again, when you're talking about distributed system, networking is probably 50% of the equation here. So we have this networking CNI, the, the container networking interface. And uh, with that interface implemented, you can now, again, just like our container runtime, we can technically hot swap our network overlays in our Kubernetes cluster. There are a few options in that in this field as well. We have Calico, Cilium, Plano, we have more than uh, many more on the list here. And it is kind of up to the, if you're de deploying your own Kubernetes cluster or if you're getting it uh, from a cloud provider, they have some preferred uh, CNI that will be deployed. For example, GCE is the one preferred by Google Cloud. That is the one you would get if you're using GKE. Calico is preferred by IBM Cloud. We, all our Kubernetes cluster will come with Calico network interface. 
So let's talk about some Kubernetes concepts. So cluster, right? We talk about Kubernetes cluster. Cluster is a collection of all the things Kubernetes has, masters, nodes, connection, network, RAM, disk, all that, all that resource is a cluster. Then you have your master is the brain behind Kubernetes. Then you have your node that is the worker of your Kubernetes. You can have n number of node. I think the highest number of node you can have in a Kubernetes cluster is 5,000. Uh, usually you wouldn't see that many. I, I usually see three to five to nine, that kind of numbers. Uh, namespace, this is the one new thing probably so far. Uh, it is a way to isolate a single within a single cluster, some logical space. Uh, it is not a physical boundary or anything, but you can define namespaces and that's how you can get some sort of multi-tenancy in Kubernetes. Then you have label, annotation, and selectors. And label are key value pairs that you use to identify your services. Annotations are mostly metadata. And selector is how you would uh, use that label to find a particular service. We're going to see an example just in a second as well. So for example, right away, we see that you have this deployment YAML. Again, Kubernetes, if you're doing anything with Kubernetes or planning anything to do with Kubernetes, uh, getting very familiar with uh, YAML is a good idea because we will have to do most of our work through YAML. Uh, so as you can see here, we have an application that is a deployment of Nginx proxy. Uh, and it has a label of app and Nginx. And right after that, we have the selector that is selecting that particular application based on that same label. Um, so selector, we can do in, not in, exist, doesn't exist. We can create multiple different relationships uh, with selectors, but most of the cases, it's just equality operator that we use. Uh, then we have the idea of a pod. Again, a pod is the smallest deployment uh, unit on Kubernetes. Uh, although container is the smallest deployment unit in cloud native things, a pod is just a collection of containers. They share the same network namespace and the user namespace. Uh, replication controller is the older version. Uh, it's, a it's now deprecated, so you're not going to talk about it. But now you have replica set. A replica set is what makes Kubernetes part system. When you say, I want five replicas of my application, Kubernetes then tries, etcd stores that number. And every time a change happens, Kubernetes automatically spins up a new copy to make sure that we always have uh, five copies running. Uh, deployment is the next version or like next uh, layer on replica set. A deployment has an idea of rolling out and rollback. So if something goes wrong, you can always roll back to the previous version. We also have an idea of how do you want to roll out your releases. So this will be an example of replica set. On a replica set, you mention how many replicas you want and Kubernetes makes it so. Uh, in deployment, again, we have an idea of strategy. How do you want to deploy this particular uh, thing? In this case, we are saying rolling update. We are saying slowly move over from version one to version two without disrupting any of my traffic. Uh, then you have stateful set. A stateful set is a way to run stateful application on Kubernetes backed by some sort of volume. Uh, this is a de heated debate between whether or not Kubernetes should be running stateful set, but it is here. It is here for if you want to run any work on Kubernetes. Uh, as a stateful, for example, databases is a, is a great uh, use case for stateful set. Then you have daemon set. Daemon set is a pod that runs on every single node. So no matter how many nodes you add or remove, daemon set will make sure you have always have at least one copy, always have one copy of that node running. It's ideal for things like log forwarding or health monitoring of your cluster. Um, so stateful set, daemon set. A daemon set, again, it looks very much like a deployment. And the only difference is you don't mention any number of replicas. It just makes sure that every single node you have in your cluster gets one copy of it. Uh, then you have the idea of job and cron job. I'm not going to go into too much details there. I'm going to just skim over them. But the idea is cron job, we can run a job in time like a cron in uh, Linux. Uh, then you have, now we're talking about how do you expose our application to the outside world, right? So we have written our application as pod made deployments. Now we have to make sure that people from outside can access this application. Um, so you, you have your service and ingress. There's multi, more than other ways to, uh, this is the two main ways you will expose your application to the outside world. A service is a named, uh, like in your cluster is a named entity that you can access within the cluster itself with, uh, from other applications. Uh, then you have ingress. Ingress is made so that you can use a single load balancer to serve most of your traffic uh, to your cluster from outside the world. Uh, so a service has four major types. 
cluster IP, node port, load balancer, external name. Cluster IP is internal to the cluster. Node port is using your public nodes, public IP and a port on that IP to serve your cluster. Load balancer uh, is, as you can know, is a load balancer. It is a thing you can purchase from your cloud provider and you can use a IPv4 address to uh, make sure your service is available. An external name is not as much used as it is used to be before. Uh, Ingress, on the other hand, it uses a single load balancer to serve multiple traffic on that path. With Ingress, you can actually serve your Kubernetes service, services uh, in a custom domain uh, with your company domain, and you can have multiple paths. You can have multiple uh, zones, like add something in front of your um, host name to get sort of traffic routed to any path you need to. Uh, we're going to not talk about too much about storage. Uh, again, the idea is your Kubernetes does have access to storage, but this is kind of like goes in beyond what you want to talk about today. Uh, then we have idea of config map of secret. This is ways you can send uh, secrets and config maps to your app. Secret sounds secure. It is not. Uh, if you want to make sure that Kubernetes stays secure and all your information stays secure, you want, you want to look into some other ways to handle that namely something like Vault from HashiCorp or KMS. Um, and a couple of comments I'm seeing in the chat here as well is that trying to get my head around. And I understand like when I'm talking about all these things at almost at the same time, it sounds overwhelming, but my goal today is not to make you experts in Kubernetes. That takes months to years. What I want to tell you is that there is this thing that is available and when you eventually have to build things for Kubernetes, you will be aware and you will be ready when that challenge comes your way. Um, hopefully this will give you a good introduction, at least tell you how big the landscape is. And this is what just talked about Kubernetes here. The whole cloud native landscape, is so much bigger. I will show you just a short glimpse in a second. Um, so we have auth authentication or identity. Uh, in the last talk, someone mentioned that immutability is your friend and I'm gonna repeat that RBAC is your friend. In Kubernetes, you can create this RBAC rules to make sure that it, you give very fine grade access to things. So you have role and role binding and, and their counterpart cluster role and cluster role binding. Uh, the main difference between cluster role and role is that role is isolated to a single namespace, whereas cluster role is available throughout the whole cluster. So what does that mean? And there is also the idea of service account. So service account is an easy way to pass in configuration information uh, to your uh, things that are running, things like pod deployment and etc. So a cluster role, uh, this is what an example looks like, but this is probably not the best way to talk about cluster role. I think the easiest way to talk about roles and cluster role is this. Uh, what the question we're trying to answer with rollback, uh, role-based authentication, RBAC, is that um, can subject verb object. What I mean by that is can user list pods? So for each user, each user of Kubernetes, you're trying to answer this question. Um, if the answer is true, we'll let it through. If the answer is not true, we'll then fail that particular request. And this is what it is for a cluster role. Uh, this is the, the main difference between cluster role and role again is this. So on a role, we're asking, can user list pod in this particular namespace? And yes, there are some comments about sharing the uh, slides. I will make these slides available right after the call. I'll make, I'll put it on the chat right after. And so, okay, so that basically covers everything you probably need to know to get started being a developer in Kubernetes. But now let's take a look at some of the things you could do with Kubernetes. Um, okay, some demo time. So a couple of, got it. So a couple of things, if you see me type LESK, that's I'm saying kubectl, I can say kubectl get co, and I have this Kubernetes cluster already set up so that I don't have to spend too much time uh, on showing you the demo. So again, I have a Kubernetes cluster running that has a bunch of application running. Uh, the application is, defined with these YAMLs. As you saw earlier, some of the YAML example, we have this deployment. I have the name car rental. I have this Docker image that is available here. I'm giving it some resources. I'm giving it some like ports and environment variables. Uh, again, uh, I can also make this code available if you want to play with that later, but we have all that available and we have deployed a few things. For example, I have deployed kget pods, kget deploy that made some deployments. Now, one, 
cool little thing that we will talk about when we talk about Kubernetes is that Kubernetes is self-healing. Self so let's delete uh, uh, pods dash dash all. I have to delete all my pods on my cluster. All of a sudden you'll see, this is the wrong one. So, so all of a sudden you'll see that bunch of my things are terminating, but at the same time, I have new copies of them started right away. So I deleted something, Kubernetes saw that, oh, oh okay, I needed to have X many copies of this application, they're not there, I need to make sure they're there. So Kubernetes will automatically restart those applications. And so this is a way Kubernetes help, handles self-healing. Um, some other things Kubernetes has is K get service. And service is every single thing as an application that I'm running. And within my application now, I can talk to, let's say from BUI to car rental directly by the name car rental. I don't have to know this cluster IP because this cluster IP can go away. Uh, so right now this application is deployed. So if I do K get nodes dash O wide, I'll get an external IP. And if I were to um, go to this external IP, go to this external IP here, you can see that my application is available in this IP. And I, in this application, we have written um, an endpoint that actually shows you all the services too quickly. If I refresh this page a couple times, you'll start seeing that this host name, which is the name of the pod, the information is coming from, will keep on changing. So if you look at hotel V1, car rental V1, destination V1, if you pay very close attention, you, could, you should see that this name for the last five digits keeps on changing because again, as I refresh, Kubernetes is automatically distributing the traffic between two of my copies of my pod. Um, so then you have the idea of ingress. Okay, get ingress. So in the default things, I don't have anything, but KSB uh, travels. I have also deployed this application here. So okay, get ingress. So I have this application also deployed on my own domain at ivmdeveloper.net. So if you want to go to this URL, you can see this application, which I don't actually didn't, don't think I showed you how the application looks like. So this is an application, this is a demo application we've been working on. Uh, it's a, a travel-based application meant to teach other people how to deal with, um, how to deal with Kubernetes and deploying these cloud native applications. So I will make these slides available to all of you. If you have more questions that you want to learn, interested in learning about Kubernetes, feel free to reach out. I have some other resources that I can share in terms of workshop. If you have questions and general interest, please feel free to post that as well. I'll be available throughout the day on the chat. So if you want to talk to me about things, uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, it has been a lot of fun talking to all of you about Kubernetes. Hopefully there was something interesting that you got out of this. And I think I'm pretty close to the end of my time with all this, let me know. Uh, and yeah, I don't necessarily think I have time for questions in, in terms of that. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much.